And uh, the title of our session is The Twin Challenge of State Building, Growth and Security. And uh, I was discussing uh, that title with our two distinguished uh, panelists, uh, uh, Sheikh Hanoushi, the founder of uh, NADA, and uh, Minister Sisse, the Minister of Economy and Finance of Mali. And uh, we were both in agreement that actually there are probably many more than two challenges uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to state building. Um, I myself, I've been involved in, in transition in fragile states when I was the head of peacekeeping at the United Nations. And I can see that one of the foundations of a peaceful transition is inclusivity but at the same time a state that delivers to its people. And uh, the challenge that I've seen in many countries is that indeed uh, after a period of dictatorship or after a conflict, there are so many things that need to be fixed. So where you start is always a big, a big question. Uh, how you prioritize, uh, how you, uh, in the face of so many challenges, how do you get it uh, right among uh, all the competing needs uh, that you need to fulfill? I'm going to ask first uh, Sheikh Hanoushi about Tunisia, because Tunisia, I mean, the Arab Spring, uh, uh, there have been a lot of crises. But Tunisia, and although it has a, a neighbor in crisis, and that is that's certainly a further complication. Libya is in a deep uh, crisis, but Tunisia has been a success story. It had uh, a peaceful uh, transition. Uh, the party of uh, Sheikh Hanoushi emerged as the big winner of the, of the transition. But it was not with a view of a winner take all. Uh, and uh, Tunisia has seen an unusual alliance between moderate Islamists. And uh, Sheikh Hanoushi has a has played a very important political and intellectual role in defining what moderate Islam uh, means, uh, moderate Islamism means. Uh, it managed that peaceful uh, transition through this alliance between moderate Islamists and moderate seculars. And that alliance is still holding. And so, uh, Mr. Hanushi, I would, I would want to ask you now, I mean, as, you, as you look at all that has happened since the uh, fall of the Ben Ali regime, and uh, uh, how did you get there, and what do you see as the challenges ahead? Assalamu alaikum. May the peace of God be upon you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, very important uh, panel to discuss uh, democracy and uh, the relation between democracy and prosperity and uh, stability. <coughs> you know that uh, Tunisia has achieved very important uh, tra trans democrat, trans transition democrat, and uh, we succeed to uh, organize many free and fair elections, and we succeed to drafting, to draft very progressive constitution where uh, the main rights have been guaranteed. Uh, the human rights, the quality, gender equality, the, uh, con, con, the uh, right of believer and unbeliever. So Tunisia enjoy the first and real democracy in Arab world, and it con, uh, considered as ex exceptional example, proof proves that uh, democracy, once it is uh, possible in Tunisia, why not in other Arab world? Uh, and now we face another problems, the, the problem of the prosperity, 
the problem of stability vis-à-vis -vis our uh, fight against terrorism. And this is uh, not uh, uh, only Tunisian problem, it's international problem, and we cooperate all with all democracies to contradict and to fight against this uh, disease. So we are uh, very optimist. We face, we are facing many problems, many challenges, but we have enough confidence that Tunisia will continue achieving their goals of its very exceptional revolution. Thank you very much. Minister Sisse, I mean, you have done a lot as a minister in the government of Mali, and uh, Mali has made a big progress since uh, the, uh, it was almost overwhelmed by uh, uh, an ex extreme radical movement who was willing, who was ready to march on Bamako if it had not been an international intervention. Um, as you look at your country today, and I know that two days ago there was a an attack that made that killed 70 people in the north. So the the security issues are, are still very much uh, very much there. But as you look uh, as a minister at the challenge that you have in your interest, so to speak, I mean uh, beyond the Ministry of Economy and Finance, I mean how do you see the the situation in Mali, and uh, how do you how would you prioritize? Merci bien, Monsieur Guéno. Thank you very much, Mr. Guéno. Thank you for having given me the opportunity to take the floor here as Minister of Economy and Finance in a country which went through a crisis, a deep crisis, which affected the integrity of our country. I am very pleased to be able to talk to uh, this crisis and the solutions we have perhaps found in Mali. Remarkable progress has been made. Concerning solutions to the type of crisis we went through, the state now is uh, present uh, throughout the country or almost, not entirely, but almost. This is considerable progress. The inhabitants of Mali have started uh, talking to one another. They have launched a social dialogue which is slowly bearing fruit. This is a dialogue which is creating social and national cohesion between the different groups, the different ethnical groups in particular. Now, this peace process, this reconstruction process in Mali was not an easy thing. In fact, it is still a difficult thing. It is difficult because it is multifaceted and also because it presents uh, a wealth of daily problems. Some of the obstacles uh, we encounter are, for example, the suicide attack you just referred to, which took place in the north in a town called Gao, in a camp where the armed forces of the country were grouped together and were meeting those movements who had decided they would sign the Reconciliation and Peace Agreement. They organized uh, mixed patrol groups and were based in a camp which was attacked, as you mentioned. Much damage was done. There was also considerable loss of life. These are the types of obstacles we meet as we try to rebuild our country and establish peace. These obstacles, these difficulties, discourage the government sometimes and the allies of our government. Uh, and this could be a threat to any form of sustainable peace. The situation we know today is a situation which is very convenient for a certain number of people. So we are now in the midst of a process which uh, presents us with many obstacles, which we will have to try to solve on a daily basis. Furthermore, this process is a very 
complex one. Uh, the crisis we have experienced is multidimensional. It is simply a political crisis, an institutional crisis, or a security crisis. It's a mix of all those dimensions. It is, first and foremost, a political crisis. Uh, and there was a coup, all institutions being abolished at the time of that coup. Two-thirds of our territory was then occupied, occupied by rebels, uh, which were joined by terrorist groups. So in 2012, 2013, we were faced with a situation where the central state had been completely abolished and where we had a rebellion on our hands with the jihadist movements in the north of the country. And it is these two factors which made the situation very difficult. It was very difficult to manage such a situation. This is the crisis we are now slowly trying to move away from. Some solutions have been found and uh, results obtained. We must continue uh, in this direction in order to be sure we can attain lasting peace. The legal form we are working under is the peace agreement we signed in June 2015 with all our financial and technical partners supporting us and all the groups who joined us. Well, you have just mentioned uh, the political conditions prevailing in your country. There are movements who are undertaking serious, violent attacks in your country. Do you think that, politically speaking, you should be doing more, take further measures, or is it now a matter of development and administration? Well, when I said the state was present almost everywhere, uh, I was referring to the fact that we're not present, fully present, in the north. So the state must re-establish its authority in these areas in the north of the country. It is if the state establishes its presence that basic services will be supplied to the population, which is not the case just now. This is something that is being done, and the mixed patrols I mentioned, which were attacked two days ago, had as their aim to ensure security in that northern area for us to be able to establish uh, uh, an administrative infrastructure and for us to be able to offer all sorts of basic services. Efforts have been made, but unfortunately the efforts made uh, were washed away, as it were. If you look at Mali, as most of you know, uh, you will see that it is a country which has very few resources. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. So few resources, a vast uh, territory, two and a half times as big as France, and it's a very extensive uh, country. We have more than 5,000 kilometers of borders with uh, a great number of countries. Furthermore, we are landlocked. Because we are a landlocked country and because we have few resources, all the efforts made in order to help the northern regions did not bear their fruit. The efforts uh, didn't bear visible fruit, let's put it that way. If you spend money on a project, if you invest on a school or a maternity in the south, this could cost X number of francs, but if you have to do the same thing in the north, it will cost you a hundred times more. Because the northern part is difficult of access, because it is difficult, therefore, to invest money in that region. Investments made were wiped away also because this is not the first rebellion experienced in that region. Since our independence in 1960, we have had five rebellions. It's a cyclical phenomenon. Every 10 years, there's a rebellion, and each rebellion 
brings along with it misfortunes and uh, much damage and destruction. So everything that is done over a period of time is suddenly destroyed. And the first to suffer from this um, is, of course, the population of the country and development is slowed down. Now we're working towards a lasting peace. We hope that the agreement signed by all the stakeholders will lead to lasting peace in Mali. Of, of rebellion. So what was done wrong in the previous rebellion that now you need to do differently so that there's not another, another cycle? Well, I think really it's a matter of uh, development. That's what it boils down to. The state, within uh, its limited means, tried to develop the north, but th the efforts were not considered as being sufficient, quite rightly so. What has changed now in respect of uh, former crises is that today we realize that investing in the northern northern region will cost us something, but it is not a cost we must take into account. What we will be able to achieve there will be done at a loss if necessary, but it is absolutely necessary in order to create, it is necessary for us to make all the efforts in order to create jobs and to avoid that certain young be tempted by terrorism because they live in po poverty and uncertainty. So that is what has changed in respect of what happened in the past with our partners. That is the way in which we're looking at things. Development has been mentioned and it's you, you, you addressed very well the political side of things by reckon by making sure that moderate Islamist and moderate secular uh, would uh, would work together. But in Tunisia, like uh, other countries in North Africa, there are lots of young people, and many of them uh, don't have a job, and uh, that require. I mean. Uh, jobs, they cannot be created by the state. Uh, they need uh, foreign investors, they need uh, confidence in the country, they need an open economy. How do you see the, the challenges for Tunisia there? There's young people without a job, which can, can become a threat for the stability of the country. I fully believe that uh, it's very wrong to to think that we can contradict, that we can fight against terrorism without development, economic development. And uh, also, in the same time, uh, it's not easy to fight against uh, uh, terrorism without prosperity. And uh, we cannot achieve the stability without also prosperity. So we have to fight global, global war against terrorism using development, democracy, because without democracy we couldn't uh, contradict and uh, f fight against terrorism. So we have to... Uh, uh, medicine, global medicine against this disease, and uh, pro and uh, giving uh, young people their needs, giving them the job. So, uh, also I would like to insist that uh, without moderate interpretation of Islam in the Islamic world. We couldn't fight against terrorism because terrorism is based on uh, lack of development, lack of job, and also based on false and fake interpretation of Islam. 
So in this, uh, in, in this uh, view, we propose the uh, real interpretation of Islam. We propose the democratic interpretation of Islam, the moderate Islam, to fight against the uh, false interpretation. The people who interpret Islam in the wrong way to justify the injustice, to, uh, to justify uh, all uh, wrong things. So without uh, real interpretation, democratic interpretation of Islam, we couldn't uh, contradict and fight against this disease. So we need a global, a global solution to contradict and to fight against terrorism. In the same time, we fight against uh, underdevelopment, poverty, lack of uh, re uh, good <coughs> education, good health. So uh, democracy is the frame, the, the main frame to uh, improve, to develop the, uh, the national unity mm -hmm. against terrorism, the international unity also against terrorism, and to help, the, to help uh, people to, uh, to find jobs, to improve the economy, and uh, you note that uh, last month in Tunisia, uh, we, we have seen a uh, very important uh, international uh, congress and international uh, meeting against uh, poverty, where many, uh, many governments, many, uh, many businessmen come to Tunisia and uh, participate and sharing uh, our uh, our project for contradicting and fighting against uh, terrorism. Tunisia and Mali, I mean, uh, uh, both African countries, but very different. Actually, Tunisia, as you said, is not a rich country, but compared to Mali, it's much, much richer. And so when one looks at both the political dimension of the challenge and the I would say economic, administrative uh, dimension, there are differences. I mean, in, uh, in Tunisia, we see the importance that you stress of uh, having a, a national reconciliation where religion unites rather than divides. In Mali, it's not really about sectarian uh, divisions. It's more uh, north, which has its own divisions, which is less populated than the south. Uh, and because of the, uh, the great poverty of the country, we heard from you that the state, in a way, has to, to, to lead in the north. It's unlikely that uh, it's not private investors, probably, who are going in the north to, to pave the way for, I mean, uh, before there is some basic state services. Tunisia is a different case, where uh, tourism is uh, one source uh, of income, and investors can be can be uh, attracted to 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 the country in a way probably more easily than in some parts of uh, of Mali. But when I discuss it with uh, with analysts, they say that one of the challenges that Tunisia has is that while it has a it has a strong business community that has contributed actually to, uh, to the peaceful uh, transition of Tunisia. At the same time, the opening up of the economy, there's still people, and it's not unique to Tunisia. You see many, many countries where the economic elite is not always uh, determined to really open up the economy uh, to outsiders, and I would assume that Tunisia, and here we are in Davos with a, a lot of business people, investors looking for opportunities um, for the creation of jobs. Having those investors 
uh, coming to Tunisia, putting money in Tunisia is going to be very, very important. And so what, uh, what can be done there? What, uh, is it about regulations? Is it uh, how can one really overcome the, the obstacles that uh, can limit foreign investment in Tunisia? You know that the uh, Tunisian system is open system, democratic system. This system is based on the consensus mm -hmm. between uh, all parties, all the trade, all trends, mm -hmm. Islamists, no Islamists. <coughs> so it's inclusive model. And also in the economy, in the economy, we would, we, our system is based on the consensus also between trade unions and uh, chamber of commerce, and uh, so through dialogue, we would like to reform our uh, system, and uh, we achieved now many, many reforms in the economy to open up our system. And other uh, projects are uh, pr proposed to improve our system, to open up, vis -a -vis to, uh, to attract uh, the investors from inside and outside, and to, uh, in a sort, to participate, sort participation between the private sector and the public sector. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, once our democracy is uh, completed by local uh, elections and uh, by reforming our economic system, I think Tunisia uh, can be opt uh, Tunisian can be optimistic, and the Tunisian system is. Uh, 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 the international uh, economy can uh, uh, have enough confidence in Tunisian system and uh, the, in a manner that uh, terrorism has no future in Tunisia because uh, Tunisian people is moderate people and uh, once we succeed to improve our, our economy and complete our democracy and uh, guarantee the stability in our neighbors in mm -hmm. Libya. Uh, Tunisia has a very flourish uh, future. Yeah, you were telling me in a conversation when we were discussing uh, this, uh, this session that yes, there are Tunisian هنالك جهاديون من تونس وانك تؤمن ان المجتمع التونسي قوي بما فيه الكفايه كي يبدو هؤلاء الغاب سيد الغنوشي لا يمكن لهؤلاء ان ياخذوا من تونس ما قررنا لهم ولدينا قدرات في الشرطة وفي الجيش تتحسن يوما بعد يوم وشعبنا شرطتنا وجيشنا في حالة تأهب للتهجم على هؤلاء الإرهابيين و in Syria and Iraq it's true that there has been I mean, Tunisians have a, res, uh, a reputation of great moderation and wisdom, but it's true that there have been uh, a significant, uh, com com compared to the population, a significant percentage of uh, violent jihadists coming from Tunisia. How do, you, how do you explain that? It's not part of Tunisian nature. Yeah. Uh, phen this phenomena is strange. Uh, in Tunisia, because uh, this is uh, herit hmm. herited from uh, Ben Ali and uh, regime, because Ben Ali uh, declared war against any sort of moderate Islam. So sort of vacuum is there. 
uh, and uh, this vacuum can be can, um, used, exploited by some uh, extremist interpretation of Islam, mm. and uh, they try to exploit mm. this, uh, this uh, uh, vacuum. But uh, Tunisian people is moderate people, and uh, the religion in Tunisia is very moderate. And this phenomena is very strange, and no future for this uh, phenomena, because it's strange of our people nature. That's a very interesting point, uh, an important point that you, you are making, as uh, religion uh, is a moderating yes. uh, factor, and it's people who are in a kind of uh, vacuum with no, no cultural or religious uh, foundation that can fall prey to, uh, so to radical... We focus now in democracy to, co to prove that uh, there is real compatibility between Islam and democracy, and we try to distinguish ourselves from the terrorist, terrorists by emphasize and insist on the Islam, democrat Islam, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Christian democrat, uh, Muslim democrat. So we, uh, we consider ourselves our Muslim democrat mm -hmm. to distinguish us from uh, all sorts of terrorism or extremism, because this is the nature of Islam. Islam is mercy, Islam is justice, Islam is uh, uh, for mankind of people. So we have we we couldn't make any any development in economy or in politics in poli politics by marginalizing islam mm -hmm. but by good interpretation of islam we can islam can play very important role in the development in the economy in the politician to to uh, confirm the, the stability and uh, the, of the country and to confirm and to support mm -hmm. uh, the justice, the gender equality, the human rights. Mm -hmm. So marginalizing Islam, what uh, has done Bin Ali was the base, the root of uh, uh, the extremism now in Tunisia and the terrorism. It's very, very interesting and important point. Now, if one turns to, to Mali, which also, like uh, Sahel countries, has a tradition of very moderate uh, Islam, and yet you, you, have, uh, you have extremist movements still operating in the country, and as you look at them, uh, it's a question that is much debated. I mean, do you, do you see, because it, from the answer to that question, in a way, uh, depends a, a bit the, the politics that one has to, to pursue. Uh, is it this, these radical movements that are a challenge, a security challenge uh, for, for, for the country, as we, as we discussed earlier, do you see them more as a product of disenfranchisement of uh, people who are in, uh, in parts of the country where there has not been enough development, what you were saying uh, earlier, or I mean, how important is the, uh, is the religious, uh, or more accurately, pseudo-religious uh, dimension of, uh, of that violence? How, how do you see it? Because that, that question is important, because if uh, if it's essentially more disenfranchisement of groups, ethnic groups, that uh, then it's, it's essentially about development. If there is a, a, a pseudo-religious dimension, then the, the policies that you will develop in terms of education, of uh, giving cultural ba uh, sort of uh, cultural framework uh, to the people uh, matters a lot. Maybe both, but I mean, I'd be interested in. Uh, in, uh, here, um, I think we all be interested in hearing from you how you, you see that in, in Mali. Well, if I may, and before answering your specific question, I would like to revert to the previous point. 
Tunisia and Mali are different from a social-political point of view. The causes of the crisis we experienced uh, in Mali, in Tunisia, and even in Libya are very different. And the solutions will therefore probably also be different. But there are certain solutions we share. If you study those crises, you will see that those crises endanger our states, threaten the existence of our states in Tunisia, in Mali, in Libya. So the first reaction is to reestablish the state institutions to make them credible. And this is what happened in Mali. We had presidential elections, open, transparent elections. This uh, made the winner uh, credible. He won by some 70 percent. A government was set up following those elections. So institutions, legislative, executive institutions have to be set up very rapidly in order to make it possible for the rule of law to prevail. This is a solution you have to apply everywhere. As long as you don't do that, a country won't function. And that is the case in Libya. Secondly, once that has been done, and that is what we tried to do in Mali, once that has been done, one has to try to re-establish economic stability. In Mali, we wanted to uh, launch a trend towards growth. For 10 years before that, we had had an economic growth between uh, 7 and 10 percent, but then we went back down to zero growth and uh, even negative growth, as it were. So we have to make sure economic stability, macroeconomic stability is established. That is also a common, a shared solution. Really high growth. I mean, many countries would envy yeah. the, those rates of growth. And yet there was a security crisis. So that would suggest that either the products of that growth were very unevenly distributed, or the course of the crisis was not really an economic uh, course. I mean, what what would you answer to to, to that? No, la, la, la réalité c'est que no. In fact, in many uh, countries south of the Sahara and uh, in Mali. Growth is not fairly distributed. Growth has to be inclusive. Growth has to benefit to the poorest in our societies. This was not the case previously. At present, we have decided to do things in such a way that any growth will benefit the whole of the population and, in particular, the parts of our population. That is what we're going to try to do and to achieve. I think the private sector has to play a fundamentally important role here. In the case of Mali, the private sector played a very important role in reconstruction, in relaunching the country, as it were. This has been um, experienced in other countries. When there's a crisis, when institutions disappear, the private sector continues to function. We don't quite know how that works, but it stays there. In Mali, that is what happened. The private sector showed that it was resilient in the face of a considerable crisis, uh, as we uh, are talking about a coup, after all, and a multidimensional crisis. So we have to make sure that uh, the private sector can continue to function, even if state institutions uh, are in jeopardy. Now, I don't think that we would have been able to survive the crisis, uh, and there was a coup, as I mentioned, uh, if we hadn't had investors. When we had the coup, the international community withdrew. The international community does not take kindly to coups. Uh, uh, for, we lost 40% of our budget. In fact, our budget was uh, feeding off taxes, uh, that uh, local companies and foreign investors paid 
to our treasury. This is what made it possible for us to continue paying wages and salaries over a few months. Had it not been for the private sector, we wouldn't have been able to pay those wages and the crisis would have been far deeper than the one we experienced in 2012-2013. I think we have to be able to reassure the private sector, make sure that it can work in a secure environment and flourish in a secure environment. That's what we have tried to do by adopting laws that protect the private sector. We have also tried to provide uh, basic infrastructures and funding to that sector. That is what we're still trying to do now. We furthermore have to reassure the private sector when it falls victim to a crisis, as was the case in Mali, part of the private sector suffered during the war th- that took the war that took place in the north. Many uh, infrastructures were destroyed. Uh, rapidly, the states stepped in, set up programs uh, to compensate those who had lost in the course of the crisis. That is a confidence-building measure. If there were to be another crisis, we hope that the private sector will continue to work knowing that it will be able to rely on the state if the damage is too great or if losses are considerable. This is important for us in Mali. We're using the private sector in order to finance development projects in the north. We have set up a sustainable development fund aimed at helping the north and the development uh, projects in the north. Uh, Each year we're going to pour into this fund something like $200 million on a yearly basis. Part of these resources come from the private sector. We levy 0.5% of the net profits made by the private sector. The sector, the private sector understands it is in its interest to pay this tax, if you like. It is what ensures security and peace. And if there is no security, no peace, the private sector is threatened. So this levy, uh, the, this tax will be levied over three years, our hope being that within three years' time we will have lasting peace. Now, Mali and Tunisia. I think Mali inherited its crisis. The jihadist movements in Mali came from elsewhere and are in particular the fruit of the Libyan crisis. The vulnerable area in that part of Africa at the time was unfortunately Mali. When Libya was attacked by international forces, the jihadist left and came to Mali. Uh, There are no Malian nationals in those groups, in those forces. So we have inherited these movements because uh, there was uh, poverty in the area. That is why we have to change the situation in the area. That's why we have to offer alternatives to the young in the northern area of our country. Offer something better to the young than what the um, jihadist movements are offering. They have a lot of money, they live off organized crime and uh, drug trafficking. So if you can create jobs, I am sure that um, they will understand where their best interest lies. Question, don't hesitate to uh, raise your hand and uh, and uh, participate in the in the conversation. But uh, following on, on what you said, so if I uh, if I understand you correctly, in your priorities as Minister of Economy and Finance, you you have to make sure that the state is present in every corner uh, of the country, uh, which is because that's very important, uh, precisely not to have the kind of vacuum that then then be exploited by transnational uh, movements. Uh, but then as a Minister of Economy and Finance, you, you, you stressed how important it is to have, uh, to reassure the private sector, to have I- investors, 
uh, we are in, in Davos, so uh, you have also foreign investors who could get interested in, uh, in Mali as they could get interested in, uh, in Tunisia. I mean, as you look at your priorities as the Minister of Economy and Finance, do you, do you see, I mean, you mentioned regulation, but do you see areas in which you need uh, a particular effort, whether, I don't know if it's taxation, if it is uh, law of societies, I mean, what, how do you, what message do you want to, to give to, uh, to investors and to, to the people uh, here who are looking at your country and looking at the whole world? They see there may be, there's more risks maybe in, in your country than in a, in a highly uh, developed country, but at the same time, we all know that risk and reward are, are correlated. Uh, and so what, what would be your message uh, for, for them? And how would you reassure them that your priorities are the priorities that will make Mali uh, a more attractive, uh, desti uh, more and more attractive destination? L'objectif que... The aim uh, which might be mine as Minister for Economy and Finance is to convince first and foremost potential investors of the fact that Mali could be an interesting choice, that uh, Mali as a destination is attractive to investors, attractive because of the business opportunities which exist in our country. Let me mention, for example, the mining sector. We are the third gold mining country in Africa, south of the Sahara. 50 tons of gold on average, on a yearly basis, exported from our country. Over and above gold, we also have a lot of uh, bauxite, manganese, uh, and other ores, the uh, crisis we experienced has in fact shown us that in spite of the crisis, investors from abroad continued to work with our country, in particular because of our mining activities. There is a guarantee, there's a security we offer to investors. Uh, we have signed conventions, agreements with um, foreign investors, and those are agreements bring with them security and uh, uh, security in particular for the money they invest in Mali. Over 30 years now, we have signed a considerable number of agreements. And in fact, Mali is well known by investors because of the fact that it never called into questions the contracts, the agreements signed with the private sector, however bad the crisis uh, was at the time. I think this is important for investors who might be attracted by Mali. Over and above the mining industry, we also have um, an agricultural sector, which is considerable in Mali. All the ingredients are there to further develop the sector, to give it, if you like, a, an industrial dimension. Uh, the country is big. Uh, we have areas in our country where there is a lot of arable soil. Uh, we have water resources, two very important rivers, one of them being the Niger River. So I think there is a possibility of further developing agriculture agribusiness, as we call it. We produce sugar, we produce rice, and I think we could do far more in those fields. We could produce uh, considerably more than what we do for the time being. So I would say that the business climate is quite good. Uh, two, three weeks ago, Mali was considered as the first country within ECOWAS to have developed uh, such a stable business environment. This is the result of uh, study doing business um, undertaken by the World Bank. So we do have certain advantages to offer. We want to uh, make sure we retain those advantages. Investors have seen that uh, crises uh, don't affect the private sector. We need foreign investors. We need them to 
come to our country so that we can create uh, job opportunities and this should uh, help us in fact uh, fight against the destabilizing forces which exist in our country because we open opportunities for the young. ECOWAS and uh, the regional uh, dimension of development and your good positioning uh, there and that in a way we, we're coming close to the end so unless there is a other questions, I, I will ask a couple more, more questions. Um, precisely that regional environment, both in the region, uh, West Africa, North Africa, I mean, for Tunisia in the eastern border, it could be better. Uh, you have Algeria on the, on the, on the, western, uh, on the western border. And then there is Europe on the other side uh, of the Mediterranean. Uh, there is, I mean, the, the, the tragedy of uh, migrants uh, going to Europe, but it also shows that the, both the human and the economic connections between Europe and Africa are natural. Uh, there have been, the, it's partly history, it's also just uh, geographic uh, proximity. And I think I'd be, I think we'd all be interested to, to hear from you in a way this relationship between your country and Europe, the European Union, European countries uh, on the other side of the Mediterranean. Uh, how do you see it? How can it be developed in a way that benefits you, that benefits Europe? Uh, there, is, there is a natural connection, and yet there's a sense that the full potential is far from uh, being uh, realized. So, uh, this is a question I would ask both of you. I don't know who wants to, to start. Uh, it's clear that uh, the attack, terrorist attacks against uh, Europe and against the uh, United States itself, prove that uh, our, uh, our global become small village. Yeah. And none of us is immune from terrorism, from extremism. So we have to fight together, hand in hand, against this disease, because this is make, uh, present a real threat against the civilization, against the international peace. So. Uh, we have to fight in all uh, field this disease, among them uh, in economy. Mm -hmm. So, um, spoken about Tunisia, I think that uh, Tunisia succeed to uh, implement and represent real democracy exceptional democracy, it's a successful story of tra transition, democratic transition. This is, this is example is uh, very important hmm. to invest in, to make it successful, to, co to complete this, uh, the success of this uh, model, because investing in democracy Helping, supporting democracy is this short way to attack and to uh, have victory against uh, this disease. Mm -hmm. Billions have been spent for uh, fighting against uh, terrorism, this work mm -hmm. to be done, but uh, there is short way to fight against terrorism is to invest in democracy in the so-called third world, because our global become small village. You cannot be immune in any part of the world. We have to be immune. Uh, immunity have to be done and uh, guarantee for all, hmm. all people, all mankind. That's a very clear and strong message. I think before I give the floor, uh, I ask Mr. Sisse, uh, I think you had, a, you had a question. Thank you very much. My name is Suzanne. My name is Suzanne Matale. I come from Lusaka, Zambia. I just want to ask my minister from Mali, 
he has painted a very wonderful picture about the contracts they are signing or have already signed with the investors regarding the mineral wealth that they have. How transparent the processes were in contracting with the investors. Do the people of Mali know the content of the contracts that they have signed? And also, we live in an era of illicit financial flows. I speak that because that's what's happening in the rich mineral countries like mine, where our you know, funding is being siphoned out of our country and it's not benefiting the local people. What safeguards do they have to ensure that that doesn't happen? Because they are at a nice position now where, where they can make sure of that their policy environment is watertight. Thank you very much. So you have two minutes to answer that question <laughs> and conclude, no, no. because we are, we are coming, we are running out of time, I am told. <laughs> uh, well, I think that about the, the contracts, the agreements I mentioned, um, much more can be done. We can do much better than what we have done. Many of these contracts were signed 20, 25, almost 30 years ago. We want to respect these contracts. Some of them are uh, going to reach uh, the end of their validity. We want to renegotiate them, and I think that uh, we will be able to do so and do so better than what happened 30 years ago. So certain important aspects have just been mentioned now. Uh, by the person who put the question, which were not taken into account when we established the first contracts. Now, Mali, since 2007-2008, Mali has become a member of uh, the Initiative on Transparency in uh, the Mining Industry. So we respect the principle established. Uh, every year there is a compliance audit that um, makes it possible to see how the resources uh, we draw from the ground are used and all information is made available to all citizens of Mali who wish to be informed. This is particularly uh, aimed at our civil society. So the contracts we will be renegotiating will be better than those we negotiated in the part because we'll be taking into account things we hadn't taken into account in the past. Important factor in the success of a country were the quality of its leaders. So we've been very privileged to have you both today, two people deeply committed to the future of their country, and I think that gives a lot of hope for both uh, Mali and Tunisia. Thank you very much. Thank you.